And I think when we think of epic fantasy arc, we tend to think of it like an avalanche, like something just like 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 continuously gaining momentum, gaining power, and just kind of rolling down. A lot of people do that really, really well. Uh, but I was kind of interested in writing a story arc that was more like a stone skipping across the lake, where like each book was a touchstone and it was flying along. And my metaphors are getting really far afield. <laughs> 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 And that's the kind of thing that you want to do with a good comic is you want, you know, comics are monthly entertainment, but you want a good ending each month, and yet you want to keep the reader coming back for the next issue. And that's just a derivative of the old pulp style of writing, the old story cycle. You know, um, all the great sword and sorcery heroes came from the pulps, and it was a series of unconnected adventures, but you wanted to read them all. And it seems like with the epic fantasy, for me, the most satisfying series of books is when I get a whole satisfying read from one of those books. And I'm not just, oh, it stopped in the middle and I've got to get the next book. I don't like that. That's a bad feeling for me. It's like, when's the next book coming out? You know, and I'm searching on the web, oh, two years from now. So I like to get just a complete, yeah. <laughs> sometimes longer. And so I like to get a complete beginning, middle, and end in one volume. And then bring me bring on the second volume, but give me a, a beginning, middle, and end. And you know, there's an overall arching thread but um, I think comic writers do this all the time, and, and, and I think it's probably the best way to approach epic fantasy. But the panel we just came from was the story cycle versus the novel, and it's and we were talking in there. But sometimes a writer just writes a book that's too long to be a one one set one volume, and so the story has to be broken in the middle. So I understand why there are those those kind of books. Supposedly too. that's what happened to Lord of the Rings. Right. Oh, yeah. he, just, he wrote a novel. It's not a trilogy. It's yeah. one book. Right? Yeah. When you pick and, up book two. And that, that's two. just an accident of mechanics. But it has become a stylistic trope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yes. All right, let's let's take this discussion to the next aspect of form that we find. This is going to get into some technical lingo that we use in the in the field. How many of you have ever heard the phrase "chihuahua killing fantasy"? <laughs> this, is, this is a fantasy that if you drop from shoulder height and it lands on a chihuahua, it's an important technical term, and and it can apply to paperbacks in the real way. Yeah. The, the door stop. <laughs> All right. When I got into this business, my first, my first five novels, each one was about 200,000 words long. The novel that I'm about to finish will be 100,000 words long. Um, and the fantasies, the epic fantasies that I wrote in between have now cut down to about 130, 140. This is an absolute trend in the field. Um, unless your name is George R. R. Martin, or perhaps Brandon Sanderson right now, it's very hard to sell the 600 page fantasy novel. What impact does that have? Well, I can come up with exceptions. Yeah. Well, okay, everybody can come up with exceptions, but the... But the They're pretty good ones. So, I'm also a Tor, and I think at Tor, this is an absolute trend. I think, you know, it's kind of, there are house styles. And I think at Tor, there, there is a push for a concise, fast, you know, get out there. You know, I, my first book was, uh, the first draft I turned in was 135,000, and bells and whistles went off, and I had to bring it in. Right? And the next one's going to be 140, and we're, I'm still getting pressure to take it in. Uh, but Patrick Rothfuss, I, I don't even want to guess, you know, how many... Uh, you know, what his, what, what name of the wind's got to be, almost a quarter million words. Um, where, or Brent Weeks, you know, he writes, I mean, Chihuahua Maiming, maybe. <laughs> 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 I think it's a paperback, but they're, they're very good books and they're very long. But uh, I do think you're absolutely right that some, uh, within our particular house, there is this pressure, and it's funny that certain houses feel certain pressures and others don't. Well, but the pressure isn't coming from the houses, the pressure is coming from the bricks and mortars. Okay, the, this is true, and, and distribution becomes, like, you get a like crash education in distribution. I'd be interested to know, because when I lived in Australia for a year, the Australian and New Zealand fantasy writers were still writing huge, and I'm wondering what the trend is in the UK right now. Um, to be honest, you, I mean, you probably ought to have somebody like John Gerald up here to answer that. Um, I've got kind of out of touch with what, what's happening with epic fantasy. Um, hmm, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're still seeing pretty thick books on the on the shelves. Um, 
I, I know when I, when I set out the tour, my contract specified um, approximately 130,000 words. I think I delivered about 190. <laughs> yeah. I had to cut it down to about 100. I think I got away with about 170 or something like that. Uh -huh. But a lot of the, uh, the the length stuff, you know, it used to be people were being required to write at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've got a lot of books out there, but one of the reasons I've got a lot of books out there is uh, a number of them were being published in the 80s where a 60,000 word book was a book, or could be a book. Um, and, you know, that... I think has changed, and if it's changing back a little, I'd say good. But the story's got to be the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, really does. Uh, sorry, I was just going to qualify that by saying I actually have just read a, um, an epic fantasy by a British fantasy author, Ricardo Pinto, <coughs> um, and it's taken ten years between book one, The Chosen, and oh. book three, which came out last year, I think. Um, and the third book was big. I mean, it was must have been over 900 pages. So, and, and it needed it. You know, he had this big story to tell. Um, so obviously, the, the British market is still bringing out big, big books. This kind of reminds me of the scene in Amadeus when the emperor <laughs> yes, comments <laughs> on on Mark Mozart's symphony. Too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> so there are exactly as many notes as I required. Neither less, no, no more. He's like, very well. Done. So you know, the story is the story, right? And the story, yeah. But when com when commerce intersects with art, you have to find a way to compromise those things sometimes and right. split your book in two, maybe or three, or or just publish a chihuahua smashing <laughs> book, or or leave one of the subplots out. I mean, you know, it's not like God forced me to write a book of this length. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually make a really interesting book. If well. You know. <laughs> My publishers would touch it, but uh, you know the the author is in charge of what story he tells, and there are, I don't think there are any individual stories you can tell in a pretty reasonable length of book. It's the complications and the subplots, and do you put them in, or do you not? Do you, what ones do you put in, or do you not? And and that's. Yes, it is an art, but it is also a craft. And you ought to know grammar, and you ought to know vocabulary, and damn it, you ought to know how to tell a story. <laughs> that eventually ends, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> story means beginning, middle, and end. And, you know, that's just part of the craft. This is not... Keats could be a brilliant poet, but if he wrote a sonnet, it was going to have 14 lines. You know? It, it, it isn't that it's fair or it's not fair. It's just if the genre requires a particular thing, you learn to do that thing. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's stupid and arbitrary. It's, you know, the rules are the rules. Without disagreeing with what you said at all, let me ask this. Is not one of, another of the stylistic tropes of epic fantasy, the multi-strand plot, the, mm -hmm. the, the weaving together of, of numerous subplots into, that therefore tell a larger whole? And does that mean that in today's market, that aspect of epic fantasy needs to be rethought? May, may, I've yeah, been talking absolutely. a lot. Um, let me, uh, my natural length is novella, novella short novel, 30, 50,000 words. That is my natural length. And if I write a 200,000 word book, as I, I did on a number of <coughs> epic fantasies, and all my, you know, anything of that sort that <coughs> turned in has been at least 140,000 words, uh, I can only do it by weaving multiple strands of plot. Uh, I've been using four viewpoint characters and telling a single 
30 to 50,000 word story for each character weaving them together. The weaving gets kind of tricky. But okay, that's craft. Uh, if I needed to, I could tell the story using three instead of four characters. And would it change it? Yeah, yeah. But that's, every time you write a book, you're changing, you know, you're creating something. So, you, you can use the multiple strand plot, as, as I agree, you really need, it is one of the tropes, but just use fewer strands. This is not hard. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to point out that one of the most brilliant fantasy series that I think most people would agree is, is Martin's Song of Ice and Fire. And one of the beautiful things about that series is that he throws all those rules out the window and uses different viewpoint characters in every book. And you get in these characters' heads, and sometimes he puts you in the head of a character you despise. I, can't, I remember when I got to the book where Cersei was the main character, and she's been the evil force the whole time. And it's like, I don't want to be in this character's head, but I'm already four books in. And I'm not about to stop reading now. <laughs> and he forced me to sit in Cersei's head for this whole novel. Luckily, there were two or three other viewpoint characters in the same novel. But he's, he tends to define that whole series by viewpoints, viewpoints, viewpoints. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it works really well. And of course, he's of such auteur status that he can have these giant chihuahua killing books and, and do whatever he wants. But yes, he could have taken out some of those if, he, if the, his publisher said to him, lose the Cersei plot, or lose the Tyrion plot. Uh, it, he and it, if that. you were selling, say, 70% less, right. they probably would. Yeah, or right. it, it wouldn't have been, you've got to do this. Uh, George, <laughs> let's consider what we can do. If, but, okay, it, look, it works. He is an exceedingly fine writer. It works, and there is commercial justification for letting him do exactly what he pleases. That is not going to be true for many people. And most people aren't going to handle it as well, because he is also better than most people. It's not just he's more successful, he's better. And the fact that somebody really good can do something does not mean that you can. <laughs> so actually, I think uh, even though uh, the multiple, like the, the different weavings at different points of view, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's, uh, it's a staple, but I don't think it's necessary. I don't write uh, first person, single narrative, epic fantasy, but I can think of one person who very well does this. It would be Nora Jeminson's Oh man, how many kingdoms? A hundred thousand? Ten thousand? A hundred thousand, right? And it's a first person, single point of view, and it's excellent, and it's epic in scope. And so, you know, this reminds me, uh, I had a professor in college that used to like to quote Nietzsche and saying, Nietzsche used to say that uh, art is dancing with chains on. You know, why do ballerinas stand on their tiptoes? There's no really good reason other than it's hard. Right? And it's hard to do, and they look elegant doing this thing, so a sonnet has to have 14 lines. It's hard, right? And because you limit yourself and you obey the rules, you do it eloquently. And then, um, I think it was James Joyce said, art is breaking chains, right? And it's when you, it's when you read the Odyssey and you end up writing Ulysses. Um, and so, I, th I, I, there is, I think every art form has these two impulses. The one to behave eloquently within the rules, and the other one to take the rules and, and kill a chihuahua with them, right? <laughs> <laughs> or in the cases of George, George's last book, I mean, he could take out a border collie. <laughs> <laughs> or a star. <laughs> but that would be wrong. <laughs> Chihuahuas, yes. <laughs> but I think the border collie is smart enough to move. <laughs> I just want to say I have nothing against dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but we have wonders about George Martin. <laughs>